Benedictus Fucus Ventris Dominus, Santa Maria Mater Dei, Ora Pro Nobis, Peccatoribus, Nunc et Hora Mortis Nostrae. Amen. In nomine Patris, Fili, Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Brethren in Christ, Laudetu Jesus Christus in Secula. This is Timothy Flanders at the Meaning of Catholic. Jesus is King. Happy Ember Saturday of Pentecost, everybody. It is a great Marian feast day. It's also the uh, first Saturday in June. I'm very excited because the Fatima icon of Our Lady was just released, available for purchase now. That's this icon right here to my right. I can't point because everything's mirrored. But you can purchase that at the link below. A portion of that goes to build the shrine of Our Lady of Fatima in St. Petersburg, Russia. And that's with the Russian right Catholics in Russia. So please purchase the icon. If you already have the icon, purchase another copy and give it to a priest. Purchase as a, as a gift. This is a something that we've been working on for really over a year, and we're very happy that Our Lady, the Immaculata, has brought it to fruition on the first Saturday of this glorious month of June dedicated to the Sacred Heart. This is the traditional Bible in a year according to the Divine Office. This is our Bible reading group, and this is a part of the Fellowship of St. Anthony, which is our lay sodality, which offers up penances for clergy and seminarians. And if you want to join our Bible reading group, we are seeking fervent, pious souls who desire to offer up this Bible reader. This is the Bible reader right here. It follows the traditional office of uh, Matins, which goes through most of the Bible, but we had to add more that was left out. Uh, so we've gone through Advent, we've gone through Christmas, we've gone through Septuagesima and the Great Fast of Lent, we've gone through Paschal Tide, and now we finally come to the time after Pentecost. And that's when we enter into the great divine mystery of the new, new covenant, yet it is still old under King David. And that's when we read the books of First and Second Samuel, a.k.a. First and Second Kings. So once again, if you want to join us for this Bible reading group, the, uh, on the bottom of your screen is the URL, meaningofcatholic.com slash register. You have to become a part of the guild, which means the guild offers financial and prayerful support to Meaning of Catholic lay apostolate. And then you have to further join the Fellowship of St. Anthony, which is offer up, offering up penance. And that's because we cannot approach the Holy, Sac the, the Holy Scriptures. We cannot approach the Holy Scriptures without prayer and fasting. We have to offer up the meditation on the sacred word of God with humility. And this is what I write in my book, Introduction to the Holy Bible for Traditional Catholics, um, which in, in this text we discuss, we discuss one of the issues, that uh, very conspicuous issue that you may have wondered about, and that is why this is really the first text in the Bible that we've come to where, uh, from Genesis, where the Hebrew name that are in many modern Catholic Bibles and the old school name that's in the Dewey Reams of the Latin Vulgate is different. Namely, what, First and Second Samuel and First and Second Kings. So in, in the Vulgate, it's First and Second Kings and then Third and Fourth Kings, whereas in the Hebrew Masoretic, which is followed by modern Catholic Bible translations, it's following the Hebrew Masoretic titles, which is First and Second Samuel, and third and fourth, all right, sorry, first and second Samuel, first and second Kings. So there can be some confusion in the Bible reading uh, outline in the annual Bible reader. By the way, if you if you can't afford to be a part of the guild, you can always get this Bible reader for free, and you can make your own Bible reading group. Um, but the reason for that is that the Hebrew, the Hebrew name for this text is First Samuel. But the Latin name, which comes from the Greek, which comes from another Hebrew trans tradition, uh, a very ancient tradition in Alexandria, that name is kingdoms or kings. In the Greek, in the Septuagint, it ends up as kingdoms, and in the Latin Vulgate, it ends up as kings. It's the same, but different. The Hebrew, St. Augustine says that the Hebrew and the Septuagint explain each other in different ways. And so there's different. The Hebrew gives us one aspect of it, and the Greek gives us another aspect. The, the most con, one of the most conspicuous examples that we bring out in my book 
is Isaiah chapter 7. When the Hebrew says Alma, young woman, the Greek says Parthenos, which means virgin. So the Greek is bringing out the most important aspect of Isaiah 7, which is its Marian element, the glory of Our Lady's virginity. And on that note, we're going to focus today on some of the glorious Marian themes, because Our Lady is really all over the Old Testament. We see this especially in the book of Revelation, which is really the most glorious exposition uh, yet of, of the Old Testament. And it's really quite marvelous. And we see in that text uh, one of the most important typologies that comes out in 1 Samuel. So the first we have in the very beginning of 1 Samuel, we have the continuation of the Marian typology that we started in Ruth. Remember, Judges goes through all this desolation and the degradation that there are no one keeping the traditions of the fathers from generation to generation until we meet Boaz. And Boaz is the one who is uh, the is the one keeping the traditions. And Ruth is the Moabitess who is grafted in. She is the Marian icon. But not only that, she is the icon, just as Mary is the icon of the church, Ruth is the icon of the Gentiles because she is a Gentile. She is a Moabitess. But then the first Marian theme we have is 1 Samuel with Hannah. Hannah, the wife of Elkanah, who is the mother of Samuel. And she gloriously offers up a vow to make her son a Nazarite. And this is a period that might, this might be what St. Matthew is referring to when he says that the prophets say that our Lord will be a Nazarite because he lives in Nazareth. And this is, we see this in Judges when uh, Samson is a Nazarite and then he doesn't keep his Nazarite vow. And that's the whole downfall of the tribe of Dan, which is the type of Judas. But then we have the Nazarite vow of Hannah. So we see a parallel here. We see, uh, we see the, the tribe of Dan being destroyed and being consumed with idolatry. And their greatest hero, Samson, uh, didn't keep his Nazarite vow. But then we have Hannah who makes her Nazarite vow for Samuel. And Samuel then is a Nazarite who is offered up in the temple, just as Our Lady offered him, offered Christ in the temple. But there is the conspicuous, uh, the, the continual theme in the Torah all the way through to Sa- Saul and David, the continual theme of the elder and the younger, the elder and the younger, the elder brother and the younger brother. And in particular, there is also these rivalries between mothers. There is the, the mother who is bearing much many children, and then there is the uh, the barren mother. And this is especially the most conspicuous, of course, is Rachel and Leah in the Torah. But we have another parallel once again. And we have this magnificent, and I'm going to get back to that in a minute, but this magnificent typology of Mary's Magnificat by Hannah. And in that Magnificat, she says that the barren hath borne seven sons, and the she who hath many children is waxed feeble. She was feeble. And this, of course, is a typology of, as as St. Saint, Saint Paul brings out and the New Testament brings out, this is a typology of Jews and Christians. In other words, the old Israel and the new Israel. Because the old Israel is the mother that, is, that becomes barren, that had, bar- that had born many sons but becomes barren, becomes wax- is waxed feeble, whereas Hannah, the typology of the new Israel, she brings forth Samuel, but she, and, and she says in her, in her typology of the Magnificat, of course, uh, she had born seven sons, which is the, obviously the numerology of the perfect uh, offspring. And she is a typology of Our Lady, especially when we read Revelation 12 and how Our Lady is the woman clothed with the sun. And all of those who keep the testimony of Jesus are her offspring, against which the devil rages. Now, we see in this, this, this typology, as I said, between the Jews and the Gentiles, or the, or the Jews and the Christians, rather, the old and new Israel. And this is brought out powerfully and beautifully and movingly in a new text by Father James Maudsley. If you believe Moses... The conversion of the Jews promised in the Torah. This text is 
one of my favorite books of all time at this point. It, it's really this incredible theological exposition of the doctrine of the church that the Jews will convert in the end times. And Father James Maudley is releasing volume one of this text later this month, God willing. And I really encourage you, especially the Bible reading group, to pick up this text and read through it because it is really quite an amazing text. And he brings out Saul and David. And I'm going to get back to that in a minute. But first, <clears throat> let me get back to the Marian theme because almost immediately we have this amazing Marian typology in 1 Samuel because we have the tabernacle. And we know from Revelation 11 that the tabernacle is Our Lady. The very last verse of, of chapter 11, before the woman clothed with the sun is revealed in Revelation 12, is that I saw the temple of the Lord in the tabernacle. And so we know that the tabernacle is Mary. And because the, because the tabernacle holds the word of God, it holds the Ten Commandments. And we see here how powerful Mary is in 1 Samuel, because they, the Philistines take the tabernacle, and the tabernacle is brought to their, their demon god, Dagon, and it just, just the tabernacle just destroys Dagon, and the Philistines are, are finally like, we have to just get this thing out of here because it's just destroying us. And in particular, we have the typology of the visitation, where Mary goes and stays with Elizabeth for three months, in the same way the tabernacle stays with uh, a visitor for three months. And we also have David in his joy towards Mary. We have David rejoicing at the tabernacle of the Lord. This is the famous passage where David dances before the Lord. He dances for joy. And, and then we have his wife, who is the daughter of Saul. Again, a typology because Saul, Saul is the typology of the old Israel David is the typology of the new Israel. We, we could also mention the, um, the priesthood of Eli is also a typology of the old Israel, which is replaced by Samuel. We have Silo, uh, the, the tabernacle at Silo, which is replaced by the temple because it's the son of David, a covenant with lasting forever. We have so many old and new typologies coming out. But we have, when the tabernacle comes and David dances for joy, we have David's, David's wife, who is, the, who is the daughter of Saul, who is uh, he, he, she grieves at his rejoicing. And for this, she's punished by God with barrenness. Again, hearkening right back to the Marian element in chapter 1 and 2 of First Samuel with the Magnificat of Hannah. And so we have once again a typology of the old Israel, which refuses to rejoice before the Lord and be, be, rejoice before the before the tabernacle of the Lord, which is Mary bearing Christ. And so Mary is bearing Christ, the typology of, of the tabernacle coming to Jerusalem is fulfilled when Mary and Joseph bring the child Jesus to the temple. And who rejoices in the temple? Hannah. We have Anna, the prophetess Anna, who's of the tribe of Asser, which is very fascinating because it's one of these law of tribes uh, adhering to the Jews which is Judah, Benjamin, and Levi. So we have Hannah. So this is already hearkening right back to the old Hannah. And then we also have Simeon. So we have this rejoicing, and they are the typology of the new Israel, which is fulfilling the rejoicing of David uh, dancing before the tabernacle. But if we have this, this punishment from the Lord with this tabernacle, how much more should we, should we venerate and love our mother? And this is unfortunately a t another type, a typology of the Protestant heretics who, who, who refuse to rejoice over Mary. They are the ones who refuse to rejoice over their own mother. If they are truly in Christ, if they truly love Jesus, they should love his mother because they should desire to follow the fourth commandment, honor your father and mother. But they, they grieve to, re to honor their own mother. And this is a, a great sin, a great sin against Our Lady. And that's why we give reparation to Our Lady with the five first Saturdays, of which one of them is today. So we need to offer reparation for our Protestant uh, heretical separated brethren and, 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 and ask Our Lady to soften their hearts, that, that they can rejoice as David rejoiced when David danced before the tabernacle. So we must also rejoice in Our Lady, who brings forth seven sons, in the sense of Christ and his church, the perfection of the new Israel. 
finally, I just want to touch on really this epic architectural moment, because really we have the, the entire architect, one of the great themes of the Holy Scripture is architecture and the building of God's house. And the first building of God's house is the garden, where man is the priest, prophet, priest, and king with his wife, the queen, over the mother of all the living, over this garden. And this is the whole cosmic temple of the world that God has created to commune with man. And so we have this temple that is being built to house the tabernacle, more typology of the church, because the church is the temple. St. Paul says, you are the temple of God. The temple of God houses the tabernacle. And we see this fulfilled in Acts chapter 1, when the apostles were gathered at prayer with Mary. That is the fulfillment of the temple of David right there, because the temple houses the tabernacle. And the Apostolic College and the early church houses the houses Mary. She, they are gathered around Mary, and the icon of, of Pentecost shows this out, where Mary's in the center and all the, all the apostles are around them. And then, just as the glory came down upon the temple of David, so too the glory at Pentecost completes the tabernacle, the temple, the building of the church, fulfilling this glorious Marian typology at Pentecost and the completion of this final days, this third temple, this third temple that has been built. And that's why it can never, the th there can never be a, a, a third temple built in Jerusalem today because that would be an, an, uh, that would be a precursor to the Antichrist because the third temple is the church. The third temple is the church. It can, there's no other church that can, that would be an anti-church. There can no, be no other temple because that is the anti-church. So that's all we have on the first and second Samuel. So happy reading. Thank you very much to the, the Bible group for offering up your penances for uh, priests and uh, clergy and seminarians. Let's offer this all to Our Lady, as is fitting. In nomine Patris et Fili Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus secum. Benedicta tu mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Santa Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in hora mortis nostre. Amen. Our Lady of Victory, pray for us. Mary, Queen of the Home, pray for us. Saint Joseph, Terror of Demons, pray for us. Saint Anthony of the Desert, pray for all clergy and seminarians. In nomine Patris et Filii Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Jesus is King. Amen.